excited. Can we start? Yeah. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, for the last installment of the world-renowned series known as The Book of Poetry by Dave Bath. It is book renowned because these videos are on YouTube, and I looked at where people watch them from. Apparently, I'm really big in Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> so, y'all are recognized, alright? <laughs> okay, today we are going to go over Psalms. Alright, so open your Bibles to the Psalms. Just put your finger in that section of the Bible. It should be in the middle of your Bible. And we will start with what we start with every week. What is the most important thing about understanding any book in the Bible? Context. Okay. And context is what? Two things that I really focus on. Number one, number one is being the most important. The author. Huh? The author? Okay. Uh, author. Yeah, author is important, but I'm not, I'm not going to get through it yet. What's the most important thing? We're trying to find out when, what about this book? Like how this book exists in history? What do I, what do I need to figure out first? The worldview perspective. The worldview perspective. And what, what is the most influential thing about Chris's worldview? It's their, their cult time period. And, 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 and cult, culture, is, culture is important, but the reason why time period is even more important, right? It's like, I'm an American, okay? But what does that mean? If I'm, if I'm an American in the 1850s, it's very different than being an American in 2011. Being an American in 2000 is different than being an American in 2011, right? Because what happened in 2020? 90. 11. Right? Nice. So that, that changed our culture, right? You, you guys remember 9 11? Yeah, you guys all remember, right? Do you guys, you, do you guys, you guys saw how it changed the culture, right? Like airport line security and like the, the, the terror of the system, remember the codes? Right? It's like, code red today, right? It changed our culture. It's, a, it's the same thing with time period. Like the events, the events of what's happening in their kingdom really affects like their worldview, their culture, and everything about them, okay? Um, Time period and understanding books of the Bible, it's under it's important to understand related literature. Yeah. Related literature, another word for this is, is genre. <clears throat> um actually this is this is a kind of important. I was watching um some of you guys know you guys know what Joel Steen is? You guys know what that is? Yeah. So apparently he comes on like at nine o'clock on right, Sundays. So like I I have him on right before I come to church, right? <laughs> he's like really funny. <laughs> um, and I, I mean he's important because he he runs the biggest church in America, like by far the biggest church, right? Because he he um, his church is out of the old Compact Center in Houston. Guess how many guess how many people come to his church on Sunday for him? Compact Center, like his basketball the basketball stadium. Couple million. Yeah, a couple million, really. <laughs> No, 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 more, more than 3, wow. 000, 30, No, it's about 45,000. Wow. 45,000. Yeah. Oh a couple of mil in the population of Texas. But um, so he, I mean, he's really important. He is, he's a really important figure in America. He's a lot of, he has a lot of influence in America. But the reason why I think genre is important, right? Because he has like, this little creed he does before he speaks, right? He's like, hold up the Bibles. Right? And he's like, I, I believe what the Bible says I have, I can do, and I can believe I can do anything because the Bible tells me I can do it. Right? But then I was, I was thinking about that statement today, right? And I was like, but is that what the Bible is for? Is the Bible just a book of self-improvement, and is it just a book of promises? Right? Ultimately, it's not. The Bible as a whole, as a genre, what is it? It's religious literature, but what kind of religious literature? It lets you know about who God is. Right, the character and nature of God Himself. It's it's a book of promises only as far as it goes as you understand how God has given you promises. You see what I'm saying? So genre genre is really important. If you if you view like the Bible as just self help, right? You start putting the Bible next to other books in the bookstore, right? Like Chicken Soup for the Soul and like all that stuff, right? If you view the Bible as fiction and genre fiction, you put the Bible next to you know Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? So uh, understanding genre is one of the most important things about how, how to read something, right? Because it, it clues you in on uh, which you be starting. 
Do you have questions? Good luck. Don't found it. <laughs> okay. Um, so here, here, here's my first question to you guys. Who wrote Psalms? Read. Really? Yeah. Uh, multiple. Okay. So King David is, writes a majority, definitely the most popular one. But who else? Worship. Other worship. There's other worship. Names and names. Asaph. Asaph. You know who Asaph is? Mm. A symbolist. Okay. Go to uh, go to First Chronicles fifteen sixteen. First Chronicles fifteen sixteen. It's, a, um, it's before the Book of Psalms. First Chronicles fifteen sixteen. Uh, and then Chronicles Chronicles is a book just detailing the early the history of the kingdoms of Israel and such. When well, someone gets to Chronicles fifteen sixteen. Read 16 and 17 for please. David told the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brothers as singers to sing joyful songs accompanied by musical instruments, lyres, harps, and cymbals. So the Levites appointed Hemon, son of Joel, from his brothers Asaph, son of Berkiah, Berkiah and from their brothers the Merarites, Ethan, son of Keshiah, and with them their brothers next in rank, Zechariah, Jaziel, Shamirma, Jaziel, Umi, Matthea, Matthea, Olifolaku. Okay, what's that? Carmen, Carmen. Okay, something, let's come to this board over here. All right. Uh, I want you, I want you guys to, to know something really important. Okay. The the origins of the temple of God. Okay, this is very very important. When, where was the law of God given? Where? Um, no. 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 Mount Sinai. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do like a, like a timeline okay, in pictures. So here's a mountain. Okay. And then there's, there's a guy, this guy up here. What's his name? And he had, he had two what? Tablets. Okay, he had tablets. Alright. What was it tablets before the Okay. Okay, so now from now, because I have now, then, so now there's daily tablets. All right, so what, what are they going to do with them? They put him in something called the Ark. From the Ark. So like Indiana Jones, he has that's called Ark of the Covenant. Right? So they put these things and these people will carry them. Right? Nice. The Levites will carry them. Okay, these are Levites. Alright, and then here are the tablets. Alright, and then um, when, when, when they stop, they set up camp, where, where do the tablets reside? In a tabernacle. Uh, okay, a tabernacle, but it's actually in a physical mm -hmm. in a tent. Okay, so this is a Tesla Mountain. Okay, whatever. <laughs> this is a tent. <laughs> mountain. I mean tent. <laughs> Alright. Okay. And then um, they're, they're basically in it's very basically carrying in that setting up camp all the time, right? Because they're still wanted in the wilderness. Okay? And then they eventually conquer Canaan. And they eventually conquer Canaan, they go to the promised land, all that stuff, and then Peter the Judges, and then blah blah blah. Saul ha Saul happens. David becomes king, and David says, while I live in my house, the tabs of God live in a head. Right? So therefore I will build a house for God. Okay? So King David starts preparing uh, the house of God. And then he doesn't actually build it. Who builds it? Solomon. But what he does, he prepares um, all, the, all the furnishings for the temple. Alright, so from his own money, and this is really important. Right? David, out of his own wealth, provides for the temple from his own people, he starts assigning people. See, so basically, like everything his entire kingdom does, in, its, in some ways, is to prepare for this temple. So, okay, I'm gonna build, I'm gonna draw the temple. I'm gonna just draw a box, okay? <laughs> this is the temple. All right, and inside the temple, okay, this is like an altar. It's like shiny. Outside. Okay, and inside he points people. <laughs> he has three legs. <laughs> Alright, um, and remember, the Levites are the ones who secure the tablets, right? And they're the ones who minister before the tabernacle of God. The tabernacle basically is like the dwelling place, or like the overall area. The tent itself is where the ark is. Alright, so now, now you're in the temple. Who, is, who ministers at, at the temple? The priests. The priests from what line? What tribe of Israel? And specifically for the temple priests, what, what line? Descend, the descendants of who? Aaron. Aaron. Okay. 
So within the Levites, a subdivision. Right, sons of Aaron. Okay. Aaronites. Asterisk. <laughs> okay, not Aaron, but his, his, his kids. Okay. Um, and then, so what you start, we're starting to see is that you start to see, like, a basic tradition starting to happen. Right? So, like, you have the Levites who, who serve God. The Levites don't have land in Israel. All right? That's, that's a really important fact. If you, if, you look at, if you look at the tribes of Israel, and, and you're like, wait a minute, but there's more tribes than there are pieces of land. That's because the Levites don't get a portion of the land. All right? Because God says to the Levites, I am your portion. That's a huge, huge theological thing. Right? The God says to the Levites, you get no land. You have no wealth. Right? The only wealth that you have is God himself. God is your portion. Right? So Levites themselves set apart for God. Aaron, specifically in from the tribe of Levi, the sons of Aaron, right? so all of Aaron's descendants, become ministers at the temple. Um, so now we have people who you know, perform rituals and traditions at the temple, but who is going to do the singing? You just read? The Chronicles, first Chronicles 15, 16. The name is Asaph. He's the son of... Berechiah. Berechiah. Berechiah, okay. Um, so this, this is important, okay? There's, 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 there's other Asaphs in the Bible. There's a lot of other Asaphs. But this is Asaph, son of Berechiah. He gets appointed to do what? What does he do? Read up, like verse 15. 15? It's in verse 15. It's like, they appoint people to do what? Oh, a, a, a singer is to sing joyful songs. Accompanied by musical instruments. Okay, what are these musical instruments? Lyres, cymbals, harps. Okay, so this guy has a cymbal. <laughs> Alright, this guy. Hi, Kendra. Okay, so this is a harp. It's a box again. <laughs> okay. And then these are, these are going to be. Sons of Asaph. Oh, this is a hard band. Sons of Asaph. Okay. Um, <coughs> So from here, you can kind of see why Asaph wrote psalms, right? It's because when you start seeing the, the, the designations and stuff like that, right, you start, people start really starting to take ownership of what they're supposed to do. So there's, there's one, there's one uh, famous blessing in the Bible, right? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his... Really? is not know the shine upon you, right? Um, one, that blessing basically comes the, the, the blessing of the Levites, right? It's like, we do this as a church too, right? So when our, our pastor, when he, when he closes up with a benediction, we don't do this as much at like Baptist churches, but then when he closes up with like a benediction, right? You all stand up and he blesses you. It's either, it depends on what denomination you are, but sometimes they have like, like a, one that do a standard one, like the Lord bless you and keep you, makes fish out upon you, but your denomination has your own blessing. So basically you start to get these traditions that are coming out, okay? <clears throat> so Levites, Aaron have their own tradition, sons of Asaph start writing their songs and such. So all that to say, Right? What are psalms born out of? Psalms are born out of the fact that God starts giving structure to worship. Alright, you can put that down. So God starts giving structure to worship. And the reason, I, the reason I drew all this stuff out, right, is I only see the journey of where they came from. And why structure is important? Because if you think about it, it all started back here. Right? Most of the tabs of God. And at this point, there's no structure. You just do whatever you want, right? And they put it, they put it in a tabernacle. It's a very temporary thing. But then when they, when they get to the promised land, David starts saying, like, okay, look, now that we're settled, right, can we not just do whatever we want? Can we kind of standardize what worship is? Right? Because, and it, kind of think about the reason for this. <clears throat> in every culture, you have, you have different influences on your music and your poetry and stuff. So, for example, in American culture, if I were to, if I were to get it, if I turn on the radio, you need to get help me with this, okay? <laughs> like, a top 20 song in the radio, tell me a top 20 song right now. Or 2011, in 2000, name one top song in 2000s. Come on, you can do this. Baby. Okay, baby. Baby, baby. Last Friday night. Right? But, so, okay. what, what is that? What is that? Oh, last Friday night, right? Yeah. right? What does that tell you? By our songs, we love to dumb things down. Like, as much as possible, right? Like, dance music? Dance music is dance music because it's literally like, no lyrics is just like the beat. Okay, that is influential on your music, right? That's influential on your music. How? It basically it dumbs things down. So even when things are really theological, right? The tendency is to want to dumb them down because that's, that's our culture. That's not a bad thing. It's just what it is, right? So like even our songs, for example, Jesus take the wheel, right? Why does that song exist? Think about that for a second. 
Why does cheese cake wheel exist in the song? Because it, it makes sense in our culture. Because we like we like to reduce things down to like a story that's easy to understand, right? Or God bless the broken road. It's another one, right? Um, and that song ultimately is about what? What did what did people sing that song at? At weddings, right? Sing the song at weddings a lot. Okay. <clears throat> so you can kind of see something about that, right? Our, our, our vision of God is that God helps, God is someone who helps us fall in love, right? God bless the broken road, let me stray to you, okay? So our culture has basically made this picture that God is someone who helps us fall in love. Jesus take the wheel so that we're in trouble, we like, say, God help me. That's influential, all right? I don't know if you guys ever think about that, but that shapes the way you look at God. So if, if, I, if I say to you, right, God is a God who wants you to sacrifice for those who are poor. Not just give to the poor, but sacrifice for the poor. People be like, what? What does that look like? I mean, like, the Jesus in the Bible said, sell all that you have, give to the poor. Right? And then if I go on the street and do that, people are like, well, 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 he really meant, he really meant, da 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 da. And you can't really take that in that context, da da da. They'll argue with me. Right? Why? Because their picture of God is a God who helps you fall in love and a God who takes the wheel. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, what David and the Israelite community are trying to do is to try to standardize what worship looks like. Right? They're trying to create songs that say, let's not just be influenced by our culture. Right? Because culture ends up influencing your songs a lot, right? So let's say, like, okay, yes, we were born in this culture, but let's let's create some songs that say, this is who God really is. Right? This is some divine truth about who God is. So we don't just like sit here every week and then whatever other people are singing, we'll just take their songs and adapt them to Christian culture. Alright? So Let's go, let's go through some examples. And let's just turn off. <clears throat> let's come back here to the side of the board. Alright, these are not academic classifications, these are the academic classifications, alright? Because academic ones you will not remember, and there'll be too many. Alright, these you will remember. The first one. Oh, I'm so bad at this. The first kind of psalms under my copies are devotional psalms. Okay. Um, devotional psalms. Think about some examples of devotional psalms. There's some really popular ones. Um, everyone put up Psalm 121. Psalm 121, and the first person to get there, go ahead and just read it. Um, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Okay. One of the things I want you guys to understand, first of all, is that when I, when I do these classifications, they're not exclusive. All right? Meaning that if a psalm is a devotional psalm, it, it does not make it not another a different kind of psalm. All right? And I want you to do this. Look at, look at how this psalm starts. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the Maker. Of, the, of heaven and earth, right? And then he goes into, you know, like a theology of who God is, right? But <clears throat> very early on, uh, I, I will lift up my eyes to mountains. Where does my help come from? A devotional psalm, first of all, it's personal. And here's another example. This is the most, more famous example. What is Psalm 23? Some of you guys can probably use my memory. <clears throat> if you play sports, you can do this with memory. A lot of athletes like to like ride a mirror and stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna read this for me. Let's let me have you read it. Psalm 23. Um, the Lord is my shepherd, it shall not lie. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not die. Not, not, only, not only is it personal, but it gives us reason to worship. One, one of the things about uh, the devotional psalms, right, is that there's a strong emphasis on our personal walk with God. I think growing, growing up the church, you can be oblivious to this fact, but this is very important. In a lot of religions of the world, God is not your God. All right? In a lot of religions of the world, God exists. All right? and, and even to Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin and to a lot of founding fathers, God exists, but he's not personal. Right? God is like the watchmaker, you know, he may, creates the watch and like, okay, now you go do your own thing. Right? God is kind of far away. What, what God is trying to say in Psalms is that he is personal. Alright? And that, that, that in itself is a, is a really, really crazy idea. Okay? That is a crazy idea even in the, like, the branches, you know, the cousins of Christianity, like Judaism and Islam and stuff like that. There's not an emphasis on it. But one of the things that Psalms really does is that, and devotional Psalms really do, is it makes God personal. So that, you know, here, if you're evangelical, we encourage you every day to do your QTs, which stands for it. Right. Where did that idea come from? Is that in the Bible? Right. I can't find it in the Bible. <laughs> right. The reason why that exists in our culture, right, is because we believe that our, in our faith that we can actually interact with God. Right. So devo devotional psalms give us kind of a pattern for that. We don't we don't create it out of space. Right. But the fact is that Christians we see this pattern in Scripture that God wants to relate with us. Okay. <clears throat> Last thing with, with devotional psalms. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm going to keep focusing on this. For a bit of give, us, give us this imagery for our walk. Alright. The, the thing I hope, I hope you guys get out of this class, right? is that a lot of times we have just facts about God. Right? We have facts that Jesus died on the cross for us, He took away our sin, we were born as sinners, and God rescued us, now we're going to heaven. Uh, we have a lot of facts about God. What I want you guys to see from biblical poetry is that God doesn't just want to give us facts about Himself. God wants us to give us, give, give us imagery about Himself, so that in our heart we can flesh out what God looks like. Right? Because, I mean, if you think about it, Christianity is one of the few religions that doesn't put a face on God. Right? Buddhism puts a face on God. Um, I guess Islam does because you can die if you try to. <laughs> all right. um, if you look at like all the animistic religions in the world, they do that. Hinduism definitely does that, right? They have those, all those Hindu gods like that. Christianity, we don't try to paint, put a face on God. We try, we try to paint Jesus, and he's always white. Okay. <laughs> but ultimately that's not how who God is, right? That's just his, kind of his, who he is as a human. But ultimately God is like a lot of things. You know, it's like how you, how you paint God. So he gives us imagery. So Psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. shepherd. That's the imagery. Alright? That's the imagery. That's one. Why, why does God use that, use that word shepherd? Is he actually a shepherd? <laughs> right? Does God need to tend sheep to, like, to survive and make a living? Or he doesn't. Okay? But he chooses that word for a reason. He chooses that word, you know, and it, and it, kind, of, and it kind of sucks, right? It's like, in today's culture, it's like, God is my, you know, mechanic. Right? He's like, what? <laughs> like, why would you do that? Like, you're not a mechanic. Like, you don't, you don't make, like, $5 an hour, like, you know, working on cars. But he chooses imagery to help us, like, oh, I know what that is. Therefore, he must be like this. Right? And that's important for our daily walk with God. So we don't just see God as a kind of a faraway thing. But we kind of have, like, you know, we can flesh out the picture of who God is. All right? That's the first kind of song. I'm going to, I'll be asking for this now, let me erase this, something. Thanks, Father. Second sign kind of song. Um, academically, academically, they call it the preparatory psalms. I know you're not going to remember that. Okay, so I just reduced it down to, to my word. The whining psalms. <laughs> Okay, these, these, are, these are some hard ones, okay, this, a lot of people struggle with these, 
These are the ones where you, when you read them on Sundays, you're like, that's awkward. <laughs> Here's an example. Uh, go to Psalm, let's go to one, Psalm 137. From the stream, the hard one. <clears throat> Choose her. Can you read Psalm 137 for me, please? By the rumors of how long we said and what when we remember Zion. There on the, the poplars we hung our harps, for there are captors as us for songs. Our commentators demanded songs of joy. They said, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, or O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy, remember, O oh Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. O oh, daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is he who repays you for what you have done to us. He who seizes your infants and dashes them against the wall. This, this is, this is, okay, I want you, you guys are old enough to wrestle with this. Okay, who, who wrote this, ultimately? God wrote it ultimately, all right? God just wrote, all right, happy are those who seize your infants and dash them against the rocks. If you, if you watch a lot of, like, secular people comment on the Bible, right, they're like, what God do you believe in? Do you believe in the Old Testament God, who's like wrathful and wants to destroy you with floods? Right? Or the New Testament God, who's Jesus, and like loves and walks with you and like heals you inside? There's, there's, no, there's no distinction. Okay, that, the, the God was the thing yesterday, today, and forever. All right? And he actually doesn't get like more nice. All right? so, that's what people think, like, oh, God is nicer as time goes on. It's not true. Okay, it's not true. Um, I'll, that's, that's for another day. But anyways, <clears throat> how can God write this? How can God still be loved? All right, and right. Happy are those who, who seize your infants and dash them against the rocks. Another question. I'm, this is an open question with open answers. Open to hearing some. Nice, nice Tim Lin. Help me out. <laughs> I know you're tired, Tim, because you were out last night. You were plus anything. Um. Can you repeat the question? How can God be a God of love and still write this kind of stuff? Happy are those who seize your infants and dash them against the rocks. These babies, right? These babies haven't even done anything. You know? So you I can't even say, like, to find justice or anything like that. He's, he's talking, and it's like, I'm just. So he's talking about the invaders who dash the babies? Their babies? Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's like, it's basically saying you get paid back for what you did to us. Well, but in Hosea, he's like telling his people that, like, hey, I'm going to punish you guys because you guys didn't fulfill your end of the covenant, and I'm going to punish you because I'm a father, I discipline you, and then I'm going to forgive you. you know what? Okay, but that, that, that's to Israel, right? This is, the baby's talking about is the Babylonian babies, uh, right? He's, he's basically saying, like, the Israelites, like, you kind of, you know, happy are those who take the Babylonian babies, right, and just throw them against the rocks and kill them. I mean, that's pretty violent, ret retributive kind of stuff, right? How can God still be loved if he does that? Because if you're Babylonian, right, you're like, you're saying God is love? Well, how can we throw our babies on the rocks? <clears throat> Someone help me out. Carmen? Well, I, I don't think a Babylonian wrote this. Yeah, that's An true. An Israelite wrote this, so okay. I think that you know, they understand that and they hope for, you know, God to judge those who do bad things to them. Okay, okay. So, uh, I think... It's also God of just, right? Yeah, it's a God, God of justice, okay. So, is this how God's going to judge the Babylonians? And throw the babies on the rocks? God is God and we do whatever we want. <laughs> this this, this doesn't help you out. What genre are we in? Baby smashing Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> That's negative. Poetry. Run poetry. Is poetry prescriptive? No. Wait, what? 
Poetry is not prescriptive. Poetry is reflective. Oh, that's that deep? Okay, I'll put that down. <laughs> <laughs> poetry is not prescriptive. What does prescriptive mean? Like intended for application? Yes. It is reflective. What does reflective mean? You think about it, it's actually written, but you don't do it. It's like it's, it's, like it's not literal. Like poetry isn't literal. Yeah, pathos. Right. The, 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 the idea is, is poetry is that poetry is a, is a reflection of your heart, the heart condition. Right. It's not. It's not saying like therefore I'm gonna go do this. Right. Like that. This there's a there's a song. Um, what's the name? I see you drive around town with the girl I love, and I said I forget you. The other one is like you know more literal, right? The, the more profane one. Does he actually mean that? Right? Does he actually mean like I want to like do slanderous things? Right? He doesn't. Right? In that, in that song, what he's saying is that this is how my heart feels. Right? And I'm putting what my heart feels on paper. Poetry is not prescriptive; it's reflective. Okay. Same same thing. Same thing is going on in Psalm 137. <clears throat> it's God saying, "Hey Israel, because it's in the Bible, therefore go do this." He's not. Right? This is what he's saying. <coughs> this is saying like. This is an accurate depiction of how you feel. God, I think sometimes we think like God wants to sugarcoat things, right? Like we can bring the good things to God, but our pain, it's like, oh, God, I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to keep myself. What God actually does in the Psalms is that it shows like you can be honest with God. In, in the way you pray, in the way you sing songs, in the way you do, you know, you do accountability in a small group, you can be honest with how you feel, Right? Like, it's kind of funny, because like if, we, if I sit down with Carmen, right, I'm going to tell her how I feel about things. If I like hate things, I'm going to tell her. Right? If I like love things, I'm going to tell her. I'm not going to keep things from her. Like, oh, I'm only going to tell Carmen the good things that happened today. Right? That's not, that's not true. So why, why would I be that way with God? Why, why would I not tell God all the bad things? Right? Why would I not tell God all my pain and the way I feel about things? That's the key, that's the key to the whining psalms. All right? Honesty in pain. And I, I feel like in a lot of ways that's why um, that's why small groups work, that's why counseling works, right? Is that it's it's like one of the few times in life we can be honest with your pain. And when we have to be honest with our pain, we can't we can't just keep it to ourselves. And this is a big deal, right? It's like in the military, a lot of guys come back with, you know shell shock or like, you know, all this all these conditions of the heart and like mind they're messed up. And why is that? It's it's because when we're in the field of battle, you can't be honest with your pain. Because tomorrow we have to go, you know, fight again. So you can't just be like, I'm scared of fighting. I don't want to see people die anymore. No one says that in the military. You know, no one says like I don't want to fight anymore because I'm I'm scared of people dying, da 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 da. Right? You just suck it up, you deal with it. But the thing is as human beings, we need to talk about these things. Right? Because they affect us. That's that's what these psalms do. The songs, the songs are reflective of who we are as people. I mean, God is honest. We don't have, we don't have to go to secular literature to find honest depictions of human beings. We find that in Scripture. Here's another example. Let's go to Psalms 55. <clears throat> James, can you read Psalms 55 for me? Sure. Um... Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint and I moan, because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked. For they drop trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. The whole thing? Um, let's read two more verses. Okay. And I say, O oh, that I have wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander away, far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. So long. Okay. <clears throat> I want you to notice how, how honest this is. All right, listen to my prayer, O oh God. Do not ignore my my transitions as plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts, my thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught. That's that's one of the keys to these whining psalms. Right? It's it's the idea of of honesty and pain. Couple that with. Why oh, can I write this quickly? <laughs> <coughs> Cr 
crying out to God. <clears throat> I, I hope some one thing you get away get get from the Psalms, right? Is that is is that idea that you can come to God with the problems. I think a lot of things and a lot of things in our life would be solved if we were quicker to come to God with our problems and lay them before God and say, "This is this is the way it is. You be my shelter." I think a lot of the reason why people get people get really lonely, all right, especially in like in our time and stuff like that, it's like why do people feel like they need a husband or a wife or something like that or like really good friends? Is they feel like no one, no one listens to them, right? You talk to anybody, it's like I want someone who can listen to me, you know? Because you, you have people to hang out with, but would you really want someone to listen to you who really understands you? That's what Psalms trying to show you is that God is that person, right? That God is that person was that when you're going through pain. And the reality of the Christian life, I don't, I don't care how holy you are. Like some people think that if you're a super Christian, nothing bad happens to you. That's not true. A lot of bad stuff happens to you. Be honest with God in that pain. All right. Give, give an example of this. I think when I, when I first um, started missions, you know, I always thought like, man, like now that I'm a missionary, like God's gonna be like super awesome to me. I'm like, you're like, you know, I, I remember I was one time when I was in a small group and someone said like, oh yeah, like I heard these stories of like. You know, supernatural stuff happening. It was like they're like, when does supernatural stuff happen? It's like, oh, usually the missionaries like they like drink poison and stuff. They don't die, right? And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, that's probably happened before, you know. But it's like, it, that's not that's normative though. It's like I'm like, like, oh, I'm a missionary. Don't worry, I don't drink that for you. <laughs> you know, I was like, I will die. It's like, what's your occupation? You know, superpowers. <laughs> but it's it's funny, right? So, so I remember like coming back from from China. This, this is back in college. I lived at La Regencia. There's like no parking there, right? And so back in the day, what we used to all do, we used to all just park at Vons, all right? And it was like, you can tell everyone parked at Vons. Like at night, there was like one section of just like 20 cars, right? <laughs> like on the side. So you know everyone's parking at Vons. And so we did that, I did that, I did that for like two, three years. So I know you can park there. But then someone, one time it started cracking down, right? So I remember coming back from missions and my car got towed, right? And I was like, I was so mad. Like, dude, I didn't park me for three years. Why did I get towed? And I ended up just being mad at God. Right? Because I, I honestly, like, I was just like, look, I, can't, I just came from missions. I have no money. Right? Like, why does this constantly happen to me? You know? Like, I'm, I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be a good person serving God. I'm trying to do these good things. Why do these bad things happen to me? And you can think that way. Right? You can think that, like, because you're a Christian, bad things won't happen to you. It's false thinking. Okay? It's false thinking. The reality is, right, is that who you are, I mean, trust me in this. If you don't do bad things, less bad things will happen to you. <laughs> okay, if you don't drink alcohol, less bad things will happen to you. If you don't smoke, less cancer will affect you. Okay? If you don't date a bunch of girls, you will have less trauma in your life. <laughs> Alright, that's for sure. But I'm saying like, because you're a Christian, does that prevent you from car accidents? Not really. <laughs> right? Just because you're a Christian, will a tornado not hit your house? Right? Some people think that. Some people are like, I live in the Midwest, a tornado will never hit my house, I'm a Christian. That makes no sense. Right? Or like, this is a really big thing in football, right? It's like, I'm a Christian, therefore I'm going to have to do better in sports. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true at all. One of these other one in Psalms, right? It's honesty in the pain, it's, a, it's a crying out to God. Right? And in the precatory Psalms, I'm just going to write that down for you guys. Alright, the imprecatory psalms, the ones that call out a curse. Oh man, that's really bad. Curse or harm. Alright, the ones that call out a curse or harm or like just complain to God. What those are, again, it's, it's not prescriptive, it is reflective. That's why they're in the Bible. Okay, and so not, you're not going to be going to you like, see, you see how God is wrathful and stuff like that? Again, what is the genre? Alright? And that, that, it's actually a good way to kind of evangelize, to say, like, look, the reality is, is the Bible's real, you know? In a lot of ways, it's like, a, it's, a, it's like a living document in the sense that it's not just like, it's like a fictional book that makes no sense after, you know, a thousand years later. But it, it continues to make sense throughout our lives. And the, the reason why it continues to make sense is because it's honest. It's not honest about who we are. Okay, next one. <clears throat> Let me just have you read this. Next one is... Exaltation Psalm, go to Psalm 19.
Psalm 19, 18 to me, read that. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, and night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched the tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run to his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold. They are more pure than gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. Okay, let's stop there. <clears throat> I just wanted to show that to you, right? Notice, notice this. In, in this entire section, right, do you see the word I or the word my? Okay? And this, and this is kind of how you know it's an ex kind of an exaltation song. All right, this is kind of just strictly focused on God. All right, and this, again, this doesn't make it holier. Like, sometimes we think worship songs are holier. But then I use the word I or Y, you know, right? But this is just a type, a, a type of song. Uh, let me start with a bad example of this, okay? Uh, this is how you are not supposed to interpret this, all right? But this is how I did it one time, and it worked for me by not encouraging it. <laughs> when I, uh, when, when, I, when, I started, when I started college, um, one of the things that Marines, like, love to do is, like, whenever you go to, like, a new training or a school or something like that, they, make, they love to do, like, a hell week for you, right? So if you watch, there's like a hey, documentary on this. I saw and Discovery Channel always has like making the cut or like going through recruit training, da 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 da, right? And you guys see like instructors yell at you, like you mean things to you. Um, I was I was telling the worst story I have ever heard from like the Marines training, right? I'll, 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 some things will break you down until you not prepare, right? So if you, if you go for a like, three mile run and you don't exercise, it's gonna suck for you, and you're gonna hate life. And you're like, oh, this is hell, all right? Or if you're like just really dumb, and they're like. You know, iron your shirt. You're like, oh, I can't do it. <laughs> I'm too dumb to iron my shirt. <laughs> right? Like, this is hell. And they're like, you suck at ironing. You're like, no. <laughs> right? But obviously, there's there are people who are just smart, right? There are people who are like, you know, parents raise them right to know how to do things. All right? And they're in shape because they, they train beforehand. And so the thing is, like, how many instructors break you down if you're already good at things? So they do things that you cannot prepare for. They just, like, mess with you. Right? Uh, so the worst, the worst story I ever heard is like, I guess their entire, um, you know, platoon did something wrong. So these three guys did something wrong. And starts like, oh, I'm gonna crunch all of you. And they, it's like all guys in the barracks, right? And they're like, okay, everyone tear off your underwear, right? And they're like, free. They take, they take out their underwear, right? And they're like, hold it in front of you, right? Everyone holds it in front of them. Now pass it down to the person on the right and keep passing it, right? And people are like, what? And they keep, they pass it for like maybe 10 seconds, right? And they're like, it's like, stop. Now whenever you have your hand, put that on. Oh. <laughs> right? I was like, I don't care how much of a stud you are, right? I don't care if you're like NCAA quarterback, whatever, right? And you're like super smart. That will mess with your brain, dude. That's agonastic. Right? So, the, so these instructors like find a way just to mess with you. Okay. So, so long story short, right? Like I remember, I remember showing up for, for training, you know, uh, right before I started college. And this is like to enter the RTC, to enter my program. And so they like really, really mess with you. I think what messed mess with me the most is like I, I feel like I was like God's gift to the Marine Corps, right, when I started college. Because like when I, when I came in, I had one of the highest physical fitness scores and I had one of the highest SAT, SAT scores. Right? So I'm like, dude, I'm gonna like dominate this, I'm gonna be so good at this, like I'm gonna like rank progressing rank faster than anyone's ever progressed in rank, right? <clears throat> and you realize real quick it's not true. Okay, because everyone there was the best at their school. Right? It's like, it's like when you're in, high, when you're in high school, you're like, oh, I'm like number one in my class, right? When you get to college, you realize everyone is number one in their class, <laughs> you know? So it's not a big deal. And I remember, like, it, I, I struggled a lot when I was a train. And I struggled a lot, I'm like, God, oh, why am I here? Like, I'm not, I suck now. Like, I'm no longer, like, a cool kid, you know? Like, I'm, like, not that impressive anymore. Um, and I, I remember one night, I was reading the Bible, and I was just really struggling in my heart. I was like, I'm like, just really not happy being here, right? And I actually, I actually came to this song. And... And you were like, how did this song apply to you, right? And this is really ridiculous, but it's helped me get through it. When I read <clears throat> from Psalm 19, all right, 
in verse 5. Like a champion rejoicing to run his horse. Right? And if, check out the context. Check out the context of what that appears. <clears throat> it's, it's talking about the heavens declare the glory of God. Okay? And the, that, that's the overarching thing. Right? The, the heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech, night after night, they display knowledge. The skies proclaim God's good. The skies proclaim God's glory like a champion rejoicing to run his course. So, in context, it's actually just about you know, how awesome God's glory is. Right? But I remember reading that, and like, what, what, what struck me is that <clears throat> if you were created to do something, right, you should be happy when you're actually doing it. And it's like ridiculous. That's not, that's not the correct application. I just want to show you how, how that application can still you know, affect your life. But I remember standing there that night, and it was like 1 a.m. in the morning. I was reading this, and I was like, if I was created to be here, Right? And if everything in my life, like physical training, a lot of stuff, and like, you know, learning in school has prepared me to do this, to be in the Marine Corps, and like to do work hard in it, I should rejoice in this course. I remember that gave me so much encouragement. I went through the rest of that training, like, and I did really well. I really enjoyed it. You know? And that's not a correct application for this. <laughs> okay? So that, that's encouraging. You know, God can do amazing things with ridiculous application. You know, if the smartest guy in the world, God can still work. Okay. But with that all being said, okay, what is what is the correct way you have to interpret interpret this? This is why this is important for you. The best encouragement in the world, okay, is knowing who God is. This is, not, this is not an obvious thing. <clears throat> when, when, if, you, if you go to work, all right, obviously, actually, almost everyone in this room is like working now. If you, if you go to work and like, stuff doesn't go right, what, what, is, what is the one thing like, a lot of coworkers will say to you or a boss will say to you? It's like, but you're an awesome worker, right? But you, you can do this. All right, lots of work people do that. Like, you can do this. You, can, you got this. All right, we got this. <laughs> Or like if you read a, if you read self help books, right? If you go to Walmart and you go down like the book aisle and just pick out a random self help book, right? What it will say, you are worth it. I saw one of Carmen's coworkers. She had this plaque on her wall. It's like, remember, you are a child of the universe. Okay, you deserve good things. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> right? Like, yeah, it's like so are like worms. Worms are like parts of the universe. What is that? That means nothing, right? But it's like people think that the best encouragement is to remind you that you are awesome. And then, yeah, that's it, right? It's like if you, if you get a divorce, right? Like J-Lo had a song, right? It's like, I got a divorce, but I'm so awesome, I'm so shining, I'm, a, I'm the best. In our culture, we feel like the best encouragement is to be reminded how awesome we are. <clears throat> As opposed to the best encouragement is who God is. That's why these, these salt exist in the Bible. <clears throat> if you believe that the God of the universe is loving, let's start with that first. Okay, but the God of the universe is loving, and He cares for you, and He's working all things out for your good and for His glory. And if you believe He has omnipotent power, like you see, you see in Psalm 19, right? The skies declare the glory of God. If you can raise your heart and your mind to that degree, you'll be encouraged. You'll be encouraged in hard stuff, right? We don't exalt a lot of things in life. Right? Like I got talked about this before. We don't like, man, my, my mom is great. I exalt her for her pie making skills. Right? I don't say that. <laughs> All right? Or even like, or even people who love, love, love cars, like, I exalt my Mustang because it is fast. But right? we don't do that because we see those faults in it. <clears throat> we actually exalt God. Right? God is actually something that we can say, like, we exalt Him because he, in Him there, is, there are no flaws. And not only is Him intrinsically no flaws, but his love towards me has no flaws. Exaltation song, right? It helps us def define our view of God. Let's, 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 let's go back to the song a little bit and let's kind of look what it says. In verse 7 it says, 
For the law of the Lord is perfect, but refreshing the soul. And the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise and simple. The precepts of the Lord are, are right, giving joy to the heart. And the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Let me just focus. Again, this is poetry, right? You guys see it bracketed off. Um, American poetry, what does it do? It ra rhymes. rhymes. Does Hebrew poetry rhyme? No. Or how does poetry rhyme? We don't know. Maybe. It doesn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, what is, how does Hebrew poetry work? Parallelism. Parallel, parallelism. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you, can, you can see this in verse 8. It's really obvious. The precepts of the Lord are right. Right? And then, uh, translate to a comma. Giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant. Giving light to the eyes. You see that? It's parallelism. Right? So, like, like the first line sets it up. The second line just finishes with giving joy to the heart. Sets it up. Commands of the Lord are radiant. Giving light to the eyes. All right? What is it pointing, what is it pointing you to? This whole, the whole, the whole idea of poetry is this. When, when God speaks, they're right. And what does that do for you? Right? This is, this is this, who God is, why does it affect me? If, this, if the precepts of the Lord are right, why do I care? Because it gives joy to your heart. If the commands of the Lord are radiant, what does that do with me? Because it gives light to your eyes. That's deep, huh? You know how deep that is. <clears throat> right? Because you can ask, like, well, if God exalted, if God, is, if God is exalted and high and awesome, why is that affecting me? Because it gives joy to your heart. And if the commands of the Lord are radiant and awesome and displayed in creation, why, what is that, why does that have to do with me? Because it gives light to your eyes. See how that works in exaltation Psalms? When your view of God increases, your joy increases. When you believe that God actually has a plan and a design for your life, right? Then all of a sudden, like, wow, like, I can see. I can see my way forward, right? Then I just, like, you know, go online Googling, like, what's the purpose of life? <laughs> right? I can see my path forward, all right? <clears throat> Recap. Devotional Psalms. Give, give me an example of a devotional Psalms. N name one out. We did two examples today. Psalm 23. Okay, 23 and 121. Okay, which one with the beginning? Um, it's it's devotional. Give me an example of a winding psalm. 137. That's a good one. 55. This is, this is for yourself. I mean, you, you, when, you, when you do stuff for yourself, you can start classifying it on this place. <laughs> it's not academic, right? This is just. Easier to do yourself. Exaltation? 19. Yeah, that's all I Okay, I'm gonna erase this on the quiz, you guys. <clears throat> devotional Psalms. What is one of the key things to understand about devotional Psalms? What are, the, what are the key points? Personal. Okay, it's personal. Give me one more. Tim, jump in. Tell me out, man.
Now, and again, ET was with mission. Came to missions with me in China. And one thing I always say to them, right? And I, I always, and every day, how do you feel? Don't BS me, okay? I did it like every day, because people love to make up stuff, right? I, I'm like, James, how do you feel? He's like, I'm fine. And I, he's like sneezing, his face is like green. His <laughs> I'm like, James, can you handle another day? He's like, no, I can't, I can't. I can't do it, I can do it. <laughs> okay, obviously you can't, you're lying to me, right? For some reason, like, and then it's Asian culture, right? We love to save face. We never like to look like we're weak, you know? Be weak with God, okay? You can be honest in our pain. If, if something is going bad, be honest with God and say it's going bad. Don't just try to sugarcoat it and tell your friends and complain to your friends only. Alright? <clears throat> Exaltation song. Why does it, why? Why does it exist? Um, to bring all the attention back to God. Because why? Well, because then you can find encouragement. You can find encouragement. Um, I'm, I'm trying to work this inside. I'm not sure if this applies, but I thought it was really deep when I first heard it. <laughs> I'm just going to put this up here. <laughs> 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 it's probably nothing to do with this, okay? But I thought it was kind of deep. <laughs> Happiness is what you. Expect and what you actually get. Think about that in a second. Together? Or yeah. is it two separate? So, so here's, here's an example. Happiness is, is what you're expecting to get and then what you actually get. Okay? So here's an example, right? <clears throat> if, if I go to McDonald's, Right, I'm like, I'm like in a rush for lunch, I have nothing else to eat but McDonald's. And I go there, I'm like, hey, I like you know, the value menu, just give me three or whatever, right? and here's three bucks. And, it, and I, I get served on a silver platter, like filet me off of Fleming's, right? But like, our chef was out, Fleming's decided to volunteer, and we're gonna do Fleming's, right? I am, I'm gonna explode. I'm just like, oh my god, this is the greatest day ever. This is like a $2 steak, right? Like, I'm ecstatic, right? Because what did I expect? It's pretty bad. I expected like some fake burger stuff, right? And I get like straight up like Fleming's grass bale, all that crazy stuff. But that's not what you wanted. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I want that. I'm, I'm there for beef, okay? <laughs> I want some more beef in it. I get a lot better beef than what I expected, all right? But if I go to Fleming's and like dress up nice, take Harmon out, right? Like it's our anniversary, go down, we'll sit down. And, the, and like that day I went to Donald's, right? So like, you know what? I'm okay with McDonald's. So like, I sit down, like, I want to order this $50 steak. I'm like, okay, cool. And then they, they bring my food over, it's hamburger wrapped in paper. <laughs> right? I'm really pissed at this point, right? And I was like, what the heck? It's $50. Why? Because you can be like, but you just went to McDonald's for lunch, right? You were okay with that. We just, we just swap places. Like, your lunch is now. <laughs> you know? But I, I'm really upset. I'm like, not happy. What I expected was to get, like, you know, funny. And I just got, like, a paper wrapped burger. Okay. I, I thought that was really deep. What's up, Tim? You're basically saying happiness is relative. In some ways, happiness is relative, right? And, and that's, why, that's why happiness fluctuates, right? What makes people happy, it fluctuates. Okay, I, I, I tell you all the time, those who are dating, I tell you all the time about your relationship, talk about expectations, right? This is like when people are dating, I'm like, hey, <clears throat> uh, here's an example, right? I, I had a friend from LA Fitness who's a trainer, and he was a really hardworking guy, right? He wasn't the smartest guy in the world, but he was just like a really like kind, Hearted. Like, if I was hungry, he'd like, hey, David, don't worry, I'll, I'll go grab you lunch. You know, I was like, oh, I'll spend time with my clients because I care about them. I want them to do well. He's an awesome guy. He's not the smartest guy in the world, but he wanted to do, be like a trainer and da da da. His girlfriend, all right, he, the one he wanted to marry, is like, was like getting ready to marry her. Her parents owned a pharmaceutical company. All right, they owned a pharmaceutical company. All right, so they're multi, multi millionaires, right? And I'm like, so how's that going for you? He's like, that goes a lot. <laughs> right? Here's the thing. Right? When I look at him, right, if you want to date my sister, I'll let him date my sister because he's awesome. Right? But why are these parents not okay with him? Because their level of expectation for him was to like be this rich, successful guy who took up the company, da da da. But who he was was just, you know, blue collar trainer. Right? And they weren't happy with that. Right? And that's, that's why for couples it's really important, right? For couples, it's like talk about what you expect in life. Because you guys are you guys expecting to live like this upper class life? Because if that if that's what you're expecting, and the and the guy's like, no, I'm happy with just you know, be a mechanic, then you guys have to be happy, right? 
But at the same time, it's like if you get, you know, if you guys are okay with like, hey, you know, I grew up where we, we just paid our bills. We couldn't like take nice trips. We couldn't buy a nice car. We didn't have a big house. We had to rent our entire life. Right? But we were happy. If that's your expectation, you can be happy like that. All right? If you just, this will blow your mind, okay? You can find girls who are okay with the lowest standard of life. That's what they're used to, right? And they're okay with that. Okay? How's it related back to all this? <laughs> your view of God is really important. If you expect, right, that as a Christian person, right, that if you walk with God, you'll never whine because everything will be super awesome, right? And God exists to bless you. You'll be, you'll be not happy in your life. You'll not, you'll not be happy with your walk with God. All right? I was watching Joel this morning, and like something I noticed, what he was saying, none of what he was saying exalted Jesus. Right? All, that, all that was designed to say that your ultimate happiness comes if you can pay your bills, if you have good health insurance, if you have a house, and that your business is going well. <clears throat> My encouragement to you guys from the Psalms all right, is that your ultimate happiness, your joy, Right, is found if you believe that God, everything God is doing is to lead you to understand who He is. Right, we just read, read that in the Psalms. If God is awesome, why does that affect you? It gives joy to your heart. If, God, if you believe God's precepts are true, what does that do for you? It gives light to your eyes. If you believe that our walk with God ultimately is to see who God is, more than, more than what God gives. That's deep, I'll never that. <laughs> See who God is, not what He gives. Alright, see who God is, not what He gives. That's going to help you, that's going to help your devotional life. Alright, and that's the lesson from Psalms. The book of poetry is the imagery. And this, this is why correct imagery is important. Because if, honestly, if you see God as a rich dad who just gives you stuff, right, your view of God is really flawed. If you see God as king of the universe, as lord, as sovereign, but at the same time as also shepherd of your soul, then your walk with God changes. Right? Your walk with God changes. This is where we'll stop today. If you guys want this lesson, it's on Facebook. I'll post on Zenga. I don't care if you say I like Zenga, okay? <laughs> I don't care if Zenga's old, I like it. I like Zenga. So, it'll be on Zenga. Uh, let me pray to close this out. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Um, we thank you for this chance to come to your word and to read it and to understand it. And I pray that you will continue to give us visions of who you are in our heart, that we are, our imagery of you is changed, and um, that we're just captured uh, by your holiness and by your glory, and not just by our need for things. So God, help us and bless us this day to continue to read our Bibles and to find joy in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.